So, welcome to my stream. For the next bunch of Wednesdays, I'm planning on taking this Flash app that I wrote in 2010 and porting it to the web so it doesn't need the Flash player or anything like that. Uh, there's more to it than that. Um, this quasi circuit board kind of thing is called the Wireworld Computer. It's a configuration of something called the Wireworld rule set. Let me slow that down. A little faster. And I'll be getting into what the Wireworld rule set is in just a few minutes. <clears throat> Mesmerizing. flickering lights, you can imagine that there's some bunch of rules that are applying to every pixel in this kind of zoomed-in diagram. You know, some parts of the diagram never change. Some of them don't seem to change, but they seem purposeful. And then there's a bunch, at least in this area, that are flashing continually. And in other places we see these signals kind of darting around. There might be different parts of this image that we can tell apart, like this is one region that does one thing, this is another region that does another thing. The Wireworld rule set is like the physics that governs this whole world. All that's happening here is there's a pattern of behavior that all these pixels are governed by and it causes this, based on the initial configuration. This particular diagram was made by uh, Owen and Moore in 1990. I'll be going a bit more into that in a little while, who these folks are, why they made a computer, what this computer is doing. What makes this a computer, and why I have any reason to be doing this in the first place. Uh, for the time being, you'll have to uh, you'll have to be um, satisfied with the basic explanation that I made this once. Now it doesn't work because Flash is gone. I want it to work again. I want people to be able to browse to it again. And actually, you can. If you go to GitHub, ResMason, Wireworld, well, if we go there, so here's my GitHub repositories. Find one called Wireworld-Player, and this is the one that I'll be working on on this stream. There's not much to it right now that's going to change. But what there is, is already live, and will update live as I work on it. As you can see, a lot of the same functionality is in place. There's an image, a slightly different color scheme, that's just a personal choice. But this diagram is obviously the same diagram the same. Um, I gotta fix that. That's a bug. Anyway, um, almost the same diagram. The controls don't work though. At least the, uh, the, the, the rules that I was just talking about that govern how these pixels change over time, that is not in place at the moment. Speed controls don't really do anything. But, um, there is smooth zoom, and there's the ability to, let's see, to load other files, like, it's a good example, let's try adder, there we go, so different
different configuration. Same rules. Obviously, still doesn't play in pause. Still can't step through it. Speed doesn't do anything. If, uh, if you look at this after uh, my stream has ended for the day and you want to know more, um, feel free to poke around some of these pop-ups like this one. Um, we'll look at this a little closer later, uh, but it pretty much spells out what those rules are. And now that's all that's got to be done is to make those rules happen. Flash back in the day was if there was a difference between uh, one of these browsers and the others, as long as you could draw a rectangle and shove the Flash content that you were authoring. some differences which we can get into but we no longer have to rely on flash to unify the way that things are drawn
raw web and not having to work with the plugin is you can do things like detect when JavaScript is disabled and show some custom content like this. You need JavaScript enabled for this thing to run, but we might as well present folks with scripts disabled with some helpful information so they can make decisions about whether they want to proceed and disable JavaScript or try an alternative that doesn't require the browser sort of thing. Um, a one more. There's an accessibility mode because there's a whole bunch of stuff that I'm doing in the CSS to make it look pretty, which is cool. It's cool that browsers are expressive enough now that I can easily make a an aesthetically pleasing toolbar. But that might get in the way of people's ability to use the page, to use the app. So I've got that to just remove the pretty CSS and we can see the raw controls underneath it. We can tab through them like so. It's resolution independent, so if I zoom in and out, like so, everything remains proportional. Some things get crowded out, I might need a solution for that, like that. Um, open to suggestions, he says to a completely empty chat. Right. So the majority of everything on screen is actually just HTML and CSS, which is why we can see anything when JavaScript is disabled. All of this. Actually, I wonder what happens if I disable styles. <laughs> this isn't so bad. It's kind of bad. It's not too bad. This is what I guess a search engine would see. When they reach this page, I might want to optimize this because a web crawler might get the wrong idea right off the bat. Oof, site specific hacks. People don't know this, but <laughs> there's a lot of site-specific hacks in modern browsers, to this day. Um, this website is not going to need any of those. No, we're going to use, well, we're going to use stuff that comes right out of the can. We're going to be writing this in my personal uh, variation of vanilla JavaScript called Binge Vanilla. Um, I'm not using any frameworks. I don't want people who encounter this project to feel like they need to use a framework to accomplish anything that I accomplish. Um, as, as we'll see, the JavaScript that I write leans kind of heavily on modern syntax, arrow functions, classes when necessary, a whole lot of module this and module that, but I'm not packaging it up or anything. I should mention that in this image actually. I'm not packaging it up. All the JavaScript is is as readable in the source of the page as it is in the code repo. We'll see how that applies to WebAssembly later. I'll have to weigh my options. I occasionally run the JavaScript through Prettier to make it uh, consistent so that however I write it in the moment. There's a set of rules that apply to it so that it never um, diverges too far so that all the, all the code is more or less the same. At the moment it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven modules. Some of these are pretty small. Some of these are utility methods that are just 
export it out the bottom to be used elsewhere. I'm trying to give everything a reasonable name. Some of these are pretty big, but are also kind of self-contained. For example, the pan zoom behavior, which should work uh, just as well on mobile devices as it does on um, on the desktop. But I am getting ahead of myself. So everything that we see here is just HTML and JavaScript. Oh, sorry, HTML and CSS. Uh, 10, 20 years ago, the HTML that would be used to render a UI like this might have a lot of weird bits and pieces to it that could trip up a screen reader or other accessibility solutions that try to make sense of the markup in a page. Hopefully, I've circumvented that. All the UI elements are actually like form elements, buttons and inputs. So, you know, this is a button in here. This is an input. It's got a label which is hidden with the CSS currently, excuse me, currently active. But if we change this to accessibility, hmm. ah, interesting. Plenty of room for improvement and plenty of time to do it. Um, here, let me just. Uh, So this label is hidden when accessibility is left out, when, when the GUI CSS loads, basically. Um, but it's here when accessibility is engaged. But still, you can mouse over these, and you see it says play pause, step, reset, slow down, speed up. Um, and all that is just driven by built-in functionality, this title attribute uh, of all these things. It's not localized. I'm not sure if there's any no-script solution to localize other than to host different content. This is also, folks would call this serverless because all the, all the logic is on the client. Um, but I mean, I could come up with a way to write some server code that localizes the HTML on the server. Or I could just actually do something like EN US and, you know, uh, FRCA for Quebecois, that kind of thing. It's probably never going to get to that point, but that's one other solution. And then I would just have a bunch of basically static pages next to each other here in the index.html, like in a, in a folder. That could be fun to try. Anyway. the class that um, the Wireworld GUI CSS detects and starts styling things. Hopefully my implementation doesn't require um, 
it's easy enough to check, I guess, in the CSS. Body. Body, there we go. Okay, so right now it is expecting this thing to be a full page app, but that's fine. Um, you know, there might be ways to embed this Wireworld player in other websites later on without using an iframe, but it should probably be an iframe anyway, because this thing loads files and stuff. So let's see. Inside the UI, there's the drag region, which is the region in the middle. This here is the drag region, this checkerboard pattern, and this thing that looks like a piece of paper. And when we expand it, sure enough, it's called paper. And it's got three canvases in it. This might actually just become two. This could be like live. We'll get to that in a little while. Um, putting these together and applying pan and zoom gestures to this paper HTML element um, allows it to sort of be positioned on top of the region, the drag region behind it. So it appears like a document on an infinite canvas kind of thing. we get into the UI because that's comp uh, the toolbars because that's kind of complicated we've got the pop-up route which is just the HTML element where all the pop-ups are inside so this is inside the pop-up route right now so is this one and they're always there they're just turned on and off basically so we've got the about pop-up and again it's just HTML in a scrolling container called content and then there's some UI underneath it that can accommodate things like the close buttons and stuff like that. So we've got an about pop-up, got an error pop-up, confirm reset, loading, nothing too out of the ordinary. Um, one interesting thing is the about pop-up is, rep is referenced in this no script. To the unfamiliar, NoScript is a tag. There you go. A section of HTML to be inserted if a script type on the page is unsupported or if scripting is currently turned off in the browser. So this is how we respond to visitors who don't have JavaScript enabled. We create a style that applies on top of the other style sheets that are loaded. It makes sure that the pop-up route is displayed, and it's a uh, it's grid. Um, and it makes sure that the help pop-up is displayed and um, has proper flex direction, all that, so that this content shows up. And here's another no script that just contains an explanation that the Wireworld player requires. JavaScript in order to run. As for the CSS, oh no, toolbar is next. So there's a top bar and a bottom bar, and they contain bar groups that are of class here. Hang on. There we go. So the top and bottom toolbars have left, middle, and right bar groups. They're using Flexbox, which I was unfamiliar with until I started this project, um, to push their content to the left, middle, and right of their container element. So that's pretty handy. Then if we look inside these, there's something called a WW group. So a bar group is like this. Everything in here is grouped together. But a WW group takes buttons and sliders and stuff and it makes sure that they kind of meet at these flat edges. And so that's why we have this one, stop, play, pause, and step. That's these three, right? 
Uh, we have some disabled ones that I've hidden because they represent functionality I'm not sure I'll get to or actually value. Um, or that's both of these. Like I was saying, all these are just buttons and inputs and labels. hopefully will inform screen readers to properly handle focus, keyboard focus. There we go. So you see this button here has a highlight on it. I'm pressing tab to go forward and shift tab to go backward. And this is just basic web browser functionality, um, OS functionality to allow you, so I'm hitting the space bar now, to allow you to interact with things without the mouse. And then, so hitting stop, like I just did, brings up the confirm reset pop-up. And it also, because I had something focused, it traded the focus with the, um, the last UI element in the pop-up. And I can use tab and shift tab to select between these as well. So cancel. And again, because it had come from a UI trigger that had focus, it restored focus to that thing. Um, but you know, if you start clicking around, the focus disappears. But it always goes back to the first indexed, like tab indexed element in the page. I'm still learning how to improve that stuff. This zany thing, believe it or not, this is a checkbox. Actually, it is believable. Because it looks like there's a small visual artifact on the edge of it that I just noticed. It's low priority, but basically, um, this toggles turbo mode. Um, you can imagine this speed control on this, um, on this system. At maximum speed, it goes at one update of the rules per frame, which on a browser these days is about 60, 60 hertz. So 60 times, <coughs> excuse me, 60 times a second, um, it's going to be running the rules that evolve this system. Uh, turbo mode uh, is a way of toggling alternate logic that kind of disregards the speed slider entirely. Um, and just tries to update it as fast as possible without uh, interrupting the responsiveness of the page and without um, without hanging the, the appearance of it. Like, you know, it, it can update it as fast as it can, but at some point it needs to upgrade how it looks to the player, uh, to the user, the visitor, so that we can see what's going on. So this turbo button is kind of like the, the keys to weird features that I'll be working on on this stream in the future. That's pretty much everything. Like, it looks nice, but there's nothing in the CSS that's really that out of the ordinary. Uh, I mean in the HTML. Or, frankly, in the CSS. So body are doing pretty standard stuff. I've got a built-in, so you know, at some point this will be um, responsive to the different sorts of screens that visitors are browsing to the Wireworld player on. Um, but for now, the font size is hard set to 16 pixels, and the entire UI is proportional to that by using the CSS unit called M. There's a few, there's a few proportional um, CSS units, but you see here, 1.5M, that literally means 1.5 times, I think, the width of the letter M as it is displayed in the page, well, in the, in the, uh, in the element, but I don't think there's too many changes to font size. There aren't a button, no, it's unset, that's right, yeah, that's fine. 
drag and drop on screen, which we're not going to be looking at today. Body is flex, and that allows us to separate the web page into this top bar, this middle drag region, and this bottom bar. The toolbars are display flex, line item center, justify content space between, which is why we have these nice empty areas where future UI can go if we end up expanding the scope of this app. The, uh, the feature set, I mean. Bar top and bar bottom use the order property and drag region uses the order property so that it says bar top goes first, uh, drag region goes second, bar bottom goes third, etc. etc. Papers display block and uses transform properties for this kind of thing because uh, to use top and left to reposition this interactively um, is, well, it's not very performant. CSS transforms have some weird rules around them. One of the reasons why this code, this pan zoom code already exists is because I actually don't want to get into it on the stream. But if somebody asks nicely enough, I could. Just not expecting to. Paper canvas with 100% height, 100%. So the canvases in the paper take up the full size. They are, oopsie, they are made to render in a pixelated way. So on Safari, you zoom in, you don't see any blurriness. You see these big juicy pixels, right? Crisp edges. It's fantastic. Same thing on Firefox, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Same thing on Chrome. Making this happen was harder than it should have been, but it's one of the places where browsers are still converging on how they're supposed to work. So one of these works for Safari, and the other one works for every other browser. I should probably document that. Target paper canvas. And there we go. So if I zoom in and turn off pixelated, it goes blurry. See that? Nobody wants to see that. What is that? is driven by and it ignores optimized speed so for Safari there's a few things that are just for Safari maybe only a couple um, and then if I do the same operation in Firefox
for Pixelated and Firefox. These are non-standard. Okay. So you know what? Maybe I could get rid of this optimized speed. I'm going to leave it in for now because it's not changing any behavior detrimentally. And all of the browsers that I'm testing with are flagging it as deprecated and they're ignoring it. So it's not doing any harm, but I will say Visit no browser is using this. Firefox doesn't use this, but pixelates anyhow. Anyway, button input. Right, so a lot of what the now I'm jumping the gun again, but button and input and a lot of the other things that are built into browsers have their own styling that is different from one browser to the next. And basically I've spent quite a bit of time looking at what styles the browsers apply to these things and unsetting them so that when I load, uh, when I, you know, make the buttons and inputs look like this. Um, there's no property set by the browser that's interfering with the logic that it applies. Display none on these, which are holdovers from the, uh, from the Flash version. Index one on pop-up group, so it always shows up on top of everything. Some padding stuff. This actually needs to be revisited. On mobile devices, the padding looks kind of gross. If I go into responsive mode. all she wrote. Can't even reach the wire world uh, pop-ups. Oh, I can do that though. Okay, so. Okay, that one's not so bad, but then. Okay, that's also okay. Obviously not portrait mode though. Things to consider later. Today, we're focusing on core functionality. This is just my own personal logo. And then pop up, drag, and drop on screen. You know what? I might as well show this. I haven't tested it in a while, but let's see what happens if I go into the finder and grab an example file, like add or txt, and drag it over. There we go. Okay. Oh. There is a JavaScript event I'm not properly handling. Errors. No errors. Great. Let's try that in Firefox. Interesting. Right. There it is. Drag enter. Drag over.
What it's supposed to do, though, is that. So, <laughs> it took me a while to actually... There, you see. Just drop the file on, loads it, shows a loading dialog. seeing drag over events um, and then cancel and they stop Enter is an event that is uh, triggered when the element that we're listening to, which in this case is just the body of the document, the whole shebang, uh, receives one of these types of things when you like drag a file. Right? So drag enter is when you start dragging the file. Drag over, we're actually not that interested in. Drag leave should be the opposite of drag enter. When the document body is no longer um, is no longer you know no longer has a a thing that can be dragged into it and then drop. Okay, so let's give this a shot. all the time. So now, event.target. It's interesting. So maybe... Maybe drag enter and drag leave are being triggered by more things than just document.body. Oh yeah, look at this. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a new state 
of the UI. Yep. And it's called um, receiving drag events. False. This is the state of the whole UI. It's just this little object. It gets reset when... Well, when does it get reset? File name. Eh, yeah, that sounds fun. <laughs> anyway. Do -do. So, in this case, instead of this, we're going to say if state dot receiving drag events is true and return, we set it to true. And down here, oh, let's leave. There we go. Equals false. No, this isn't right. What we need to do is to be able to ignore... Ugh. Okay, hang on. MDN event. Current target. Okay. I think that's what we want. event. Cool, cool. Okay. Instead of drag leave, I'm going to try drag end. Oh, global event handlers. This is what I should be using. Or really... Okay, let me try something. So we still have drag enter, drag over, drag leave, which is the opposite of drag enter, and drop, which is drag leave, except it also starts loading from the file that is being dropped. So, you know what, I'm just going to look for all event listeners attached to document.body. Okay, it's just these drag ones. So, I'll try this. Just listening to them from document. I'm not sure if that's 
how global event handlers work, but it's worth a shot. Clear the console. That does work. I'm going to stick with document.body, try drag, drag exit instead, Never triggered. Was it called drag exit? Yeah. And then there's drag end. Okay, that's what I meant, drag end. Okay. Here there be drag ends. Still didn't work. Hmm. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I kind of want to... Bounce. All this drag enter and drag leave stuff. Let's see. There we go. You're going to see me do that a whole bunch on this stream. Sublime text is um, one of those text editors that allow you to put the cursor in a bunch of places, such as this. Uh, what I just did is terrible, but uh, this sort of thing, where you can copy and paste you know, multiple things like sort of thing. Handy. It means that operations you perform, like transformations you perform on your code, are consistent across all the places where you're transforming it. Instead of having to like modify this, and then modify this, and then modify this, and then this. Okay, you know, drag over serves no purpose, so I'm and it's noisy, so I'm gonna just delete this and try this again. Drag over. Okay, so it immediately emits a leave. That's interesting. over, enter, enter, leave, enter, leave. <laughs> enter, leave, enter, leave, enter, leave, enter, leave. And then finally, 
leave. Okay, you know what? I've got a solution. <laughs> we can count these. This is ridiculous. Drag. Uh, drag. <sighs> Event count zero. Okay. <laughs> this is bizarre. Okay. There might be a better solution for this. I hope there is, because this is weird. But I can basically say if state dot drag event count is greater than zero, return. State dot drag event count increment. And then in drag leave and drop, I can do if the drag event count is equal to zero, yeah, might as well do less than equal to zero return state dot drag event count minus minus. Is that right? Is greater than zero? Okay, no, 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 no. There we go. Okay, I gotta, I gotta fix these conditions, but the drag event count increments and decrements correctly. I think with drop, we're gonna say it equals zero. So then enter is plus plus, leave is minus minus. That's good. If it's greater than zero, then whatever. And here, if it's less than or equal to zero, whatever. Okay. And I'm gonna move this down to there. Drag enter. I'm gonna move this down. Drag leave. You know what? Keep the magic. Because I want to see what the tag names are of the things that are triggering these. Drag. Leave. Okay, enter is not being triggered at all. Drag event count. currently zero. I start dragging. It becomes one and then two and then one. Zero. One, zero, one. And that is what is important. Hmm. 
Oh, that's why. This pop-up thing. Okay, okay. I'm confusing myself. Happens all the time. So... Drag event count is strictly equal to one. Yeah. If it's greater than one return, show pop up. If it's. And then when you leave, if it's. greater than zero return, hide pop up. I think that's right. Drag event probably handles escape. Play drag end. And I will look into that next. This deserves some documentation. propagation that I'm doing up here is one of the culprits. Propagation is the idea that an event actually bubbles up from the element that targets it to its parent element and then to that parent element all the way to the actual object that has the event listener on it. surprised if I'm using drag events improperly with the event listeners, but this does seem to work consistently. I just also need a
Let's just try that. was that not what I was planning to do on my first night streaming this. Oh, and also that didn't work. <laughs> so, drag, drop. Okay, let's see what's going on there. Um, drag in. Syntax highlighting failure in Safari's web inspector. But set paper. Search for drag. There they are. Drop. Adder. There we go. Oh, no. It didn't even trigger. Okay. Browsers behave differently, but their web inspectors, their development stuff. There we go. Huh. Huh. 
try to interpret image rendering optimize speed. So the GUI changes that I've made so far, I can use stash, git stash, drag event fixes. I can give it a name, it goes into a little box, like that, and I can reapply them. But in the meantime, that resets the behavior. So now it's working. So there's something that I did with that counter that broke all of that. I know I don't need drag over. Oh, I should mention, <laughs> this stash is great and all, but honestly, there is also an undo history in GUI.js, and so I can use that to copy and redo. So now I have this code, right? I'll put that comment back in there, drag, enter. That comment still applies. Um, I'm gonna get rid of these returns. I'm not too worried about them. They mostly just make sure that uh, stuff isn't unnecessarily happening repeatedly. Maybe prevent default. No. Drag over, I don't need. Oh! Drag over was actually doing something. Oh, hi Diddly, thanks for joining the, uh, the stream. Uh, the bug is... here, let me comment this out. The bug is as follows. I've got this code that is meant to show and hide this drop file to load uh, div, or HTML element on top of everything. And it's not handling the hide properly. And one of the reasons that that's the case is because the drag events that I thought would be single. Like, I, I thought that document body would only dispatch a drag enter uh, event the first time that a dragged object enters that region. But in fact, it's dispatching it for every single child in that region. Which I don't want, but I don't know how to circumvent. You know, I might as well search for that, so drag event only from top element. But yeah, um, the fix that I was attempting in that git stash the drag event is fired when a dragged element or text selection enters a valid drop target. Right, so I think all this stuff is a valid drop target. Everything in... Yeah, so here's the... <laughs> so body is where I'm listening, and I suspect everything in here is a valid drop target, and it shouldn't be. Are things valid drop targets by default? Valid drop target. Drag operations. Drop. Okay, here we go. Is that some CSS stuff? Uh, this is HTML. I, that's not what you're asking. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think draggable. So if it's an attribute, it's probably an HTML thing. Here, let me let me read this. By the way, brand new stream. Uh, one of the goals of this stream is that you folks can watch me stumble and fall and eat pavement live. I'm actually really excited about that. I don't want people to get this idea that programmers know what they're doing 100% of the time, or even 50% of the time. So I'm going to be looking at a lot of MDN. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming along for the ride. Um, let's see. Certain cases where... <laughs> uh, 
You and me both, Diddly. I wonder if I know Diddly. I invited pretty much everyone that I know. Oh, hi, Patrick. How's it going? <laughs> I could have guessed that if I'd had enough time. Um, if I gave myself the time. No, I will, I will not be trying to identify the real-life identities of everybody who drop, uh, stops in, though. Um, okay, so... In HTML, apart from the default behavior of images, links, and selections, no other elements are draggable by default. Images, links, and selections. I don't think I have images. Canvases might count, but I doubt it. Canvas draggable? Probably not. Hang on. Oh, okay, okay, okay. This is okay. This is... So what this is talking about, I think, is when you select something, you can then click and drag it, and it's like, ooh, ah, right? So this is draggable. Um, if I find an image, click and drag, draggable. That, that was actually an A tag. <laughs> That's a... Yeah, cool. Thanks for, uh, thanks for stopping by, Diddly. Uh, yeah, so developer mozilla.org is the link associated with the A tag that's wrapped around that. Um, is there an image around here that I can demonstrate on that is not part of an A tag? I think most images these days are wrapped in A tags. Okay. This one isn't. There we go. Click and drag. Image tag, click and drag. It's draggable. So I don't think draggable is associated with what we are trying to fix. Okay. In a web page, you should call the prevent default method of the event if you have accepted the drop. So the browser's default handling is not triggered by the drop's data as well. For example, when a link is dragged to a web page, Firefox will open a link. Right, so that's what we're seeing. We don't want that. We want... We want this. We want to prevent default here when the drop is valid. So maybe that's what's going on. No, but I still want to see if there's a way to keep drag events from dispatching unnecessarily. Specifying drop targets. A listener for the drag enter and drag over events used to indicate drop targets. That is, places where dragged items may be dropped. If you want to allow a drop, you must prevent the default handling by canceling both the drag enter and drag over events. You can do this by either returning false from the attribute defined event listeners or by calling events prevent default.
Okay, I'm gonna try this again from the top. Drag event document body. Ago, the cat encountered. Okay, solve it with a timeout. Don't want that. Dot, and then console.log event.target dot tag name event dot current target dot tag name. have drag leave, that's why. Drag leave. Drag leave. How much you want to bet this will actually fix the problem entirely? Yup. That's what I should have been doing this whole time. Okay. <laughs> This is programming. Okay. Oh, I missed I missed an obvious pun. Two drag enter, one drag leave. But I'm not using that solution anymore. So Right. Gonna go back into here. Um, accepting drag. False. And then down here. Just to get away from this idea that um, like this drag logic should not be driven by whether the current pop-up is null or not or something like that. It should be if the if it's not currently accepting the drag, the return, no, that's unnecessary, so might as well just get rid of it. Drag over, unnecessary, get rid of it. Drag leave is necessary, um, and hide pop-up. 
And I think this only happens... I think drag leave only happens if you had a valid drag already happening. So that shouldn't... I'm deleting my console logs. That's how you know that I have enough confidence to just plow through this. And again, drop only happens if there's a valid drag operation. Cool. And then document, okay, just copy paste. Um, yeah. Const cancel drag equals. I'm just gonna cancel drag. Because there's gonna be a couple things that do this. Um, drag end. What is it? Drag end and drag. Hang on. Drag end. Check the drop effects. Yeah, don't need to worry about that. Finishing a drag. Okay, drag end is called no matter what. And then drag exit isn't even here. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. Thanks, MDN. MDN, drag exit. What day is today? It's June 30th, okay. Oh, there isn't one. No, I could have sworn there was one. Drag exit, there is one, okay. Drag exit is red. This event is fine. Okay, why is this red? Normally something is red if... One second. I'm just gonna take a deep dive to the... Standard, drag exit, drag leave, okay, drag exit, <laughs> isn't in the standard, but drag end is, okay, so drag end is almost cancel drag, but it's not quite, so, event, Yeah, so this is the last day of June. Uh, it's the end of Pride Month. Drag end until next year. Um, drag end. So how do I know whether it succeeds or not? You know what? Let's just find out. Let's find out whether drag end is triggered even when a drag succeeds. <laughs> what? What? What happened? Propagation, prevent default, show load from file. So this should have happened. I'll just uh, toggle that. What in Sam Hell? Okay. 
let's look at this again. I'm no longer worried about these at all. And... and drop. That makes sense. Boom. We're going to immediately stop propagation so that the browser doesn't try to do what it's... Okay. Why? Maybe... Okay, maybe... Maybe all these need to be enabled. I probably don't need to do stop propagation because this is on the document. Yeah, that worked. Enter overdrop. Okay. So, stop propagation is probably unnecessary. Yeah, unnecessary. Let me explain what I'm talking about. We are now listening for an event from document, which is one of the things that broadcasts global events. Document is not actually in the document object model. In other words, these events that bubble up from wherever they're actually emitted from in the DOM, um, the document's events don't do anything like that. It's global. So this is unnecessary, this stop propagation stuff. Because nothing propagates from the document, as far as I know. I don't think drag over is necessary. Testing again. Drag, drop. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Drag, drop. Oh, wow. Humble drag over is necessary. Wow. Okay. I'm just going to leave this. Enter is only being called once, so I'm not actually worried about that. Show pop up, it's fine. Drag end is not being called, that's good. Um, but it should hide the pop up. So both of these hide pop up. Accepting drag is true. 
and we show the pop-up. If state.accepting drag state.accepting drag equals false. Hide the pop-up. Same down here. Um, not the case. Drag end accepting drag is false. Right. So actually without. I think the browser actually can determine whether... Okay, so to do validate the file associated with the drag event. Data transfer file. text or MCL. Should be supported file type. Then in this, if state current pop up isn't pop ups drag and drop show it. Here, if it is, then we hide it. And then also down here. If it is, then we hide it. If it is, then we hide it. Really, this isn't necessary here because show load from file shows a pop-up, which will hide the previous pop-up. Um, I'm making it explicit for now. Same old problem. So drag leave. Huh. What's causing drag leave? We don't care about drag leave. No, we do. Because we want to detect. Whoopsie. We want to detect when the mouse is no longer over the entire window.
what we can do then is drag leave I still can't believe this is necessary drag over drag leave and then vent so we can inspect it Everything that comes with a mouse event, and we can actually compare the coordinates of the mouse with the size of the window. Okay. So, mouse event. Client X. Oh, that's why. Event dot client X and Y. Getting some undefines from window because it's the HTML elements. Document body client width or something. Document body client with There they are. Okay. Getting valid values, and we now want to distinguish between drag leave that we want to ignore because it's inside the window, and drag leave that we want to take seriously, which is outside the window. So, 
if event dot client x here const client x client y equals event I think that actually that compiles right <laughs> yeah destructuring um, if client x is less than zero or client x is greater than document dot body dot client width return I mean we still want to have a default and then same with y except client height and we will complain I'm sinking a ton of time into this tonight.
Oh, that's annoying. That gets ignored. Okay, this is just too much of a hack. So, not going this route. Maybe just mouse leave, which I probably already have. <laughs> Let's just try this. What could what could go wrong? Drag end didn't get called. Just can't win, folks. Immediately called. a library. It's a library. Okay. Not using libraries. Not when I got this going on. Zero frameworks. Browser or nothing. Oh, that's weird. Drag leave. Drag leave. There we go. Let's look for that again. So not drag end. Drag end was not called. <sighs> Body. what I want to do tonight. Signs point to no. Oh, cool. I had a breakpoint after all. Drag, drop, works. Drag. Doesn't. Yeah. 
to do. Bug. Drag events aren't being properly handled. Investigate the actual behavior of drag events. Document the body. Propagation was necessary after all. I don't know. No, you know what? I will get this done tonight. There are other things that I want to bring up in the stream. But so much of this particular stream has gone towards those drag events that, honestly, nobody's going to be looking through this video for anything other than drag event. So I think what I'll do is next week... I'll basically start the stream off with a whole spiel about why I'm doing this in the first place. Um, unless somebody drops in and goes, what are you doing and why are you doing it? So, let's give this one more try. Getting rid of this. GUI JS. Drag event. Drag enter. Drop, get rid of that. Drag leave. Console.log leave. Event.target. Dot tag name. Oh, that's right. Okay, so that's actually important. Ignore, drag, and drop. Ignore drag events if a pop-up is open. Okay. And then I'm being kind of cavalier. Well, I know there's no pop-up open, so I'm showing one. Drop, hide pop-up, that's fine. That's not necessary. Okay. And I might as well also listen for drag end, which was not happening for some reason. Let's do this. Leave. Leave. Leave, 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 leave. No end. MDN, drag, events, drag end.
passes. Draggable, I don't care about. I'll drag start again, I don't care about. Or do I? Drag start, drag end. Okay. events are now supported. Interesting. What is this doing? pop-up is the drop zone. Okay, so... No, but this is an attribute. Whatever. 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 Probably some jQuery stuff that does not apply to my project whatsoever. Okay, so I could do that. So in layout CSS, I could make Body dot accepting drag star pointer events none. Woof. Not sure how I feel about this. Okay. Let's Yeah. 
still aren't getting the drag end of it, which is weird. And then down here, drop, or drag, drop. Okay, cool. So now we can listen for... So in drag leave, we can now do... If event dot... What was that, target? Yeah. If event dot target is event dot current target. Body, then hide pop up. Oof. I mean, that looks good. over still it's weird that it would be necessary drag end still never happening you know, it's relatively readable. I will summarize it once testing and making sure it works. Hide, hide show, hide show, hide show, hide, let go, still interactive, oopsie, show, mouse over here, hide, show, cool, 
load. Interactive. Show hide. Interactive. Okay. That took hours. That took the whole stream, more or less. We've still got 45 minutes before I uh, have to hit the hay, but let me reiterate what we've done. So first of all, <clears throat> don't need this anymore. We created a style called, uh, call, uh, we created a uh, style declaration that matches body.accepting drag star. So everything under body uh, gets no pointer events. Yeah, pretty severe. But that's okay. This only happens this only happens once in a blue moon. This is an intermittent uh, style change. We changed a whole bunch of code in the drag handlers, which all conveniently fit on the screen at the same time. <clears throat> drag enter early returns if there's a pop-up open. We do not allow drag and drop to work if a pop-up is already open. That's fair. That's just user, user experience. In all of these drag event handlers, we prevent default because we don't want the browser to just pop open the file that we're dropping in. Um, still need to do um, don't accept any and all files. Should be more explicit. To do. Um, look at file name and mime type. Decide if it's acceptable. There we go. Decide whether to accept it. Okay, there we go. We need to actually choose what files our app accepts. Right now, it doesn't care. Um, it'll just try to do whatever. Actually, it'll complain if I drop something like... Oopsie. If I drop um, an image in there. Load failed, couldn't load button GIF, unrecognized file format. So that's fair. It's not the worst thing. Um, but it would be cool if the, player, if the user immediately got uh, visual confirmation that the file they're dropping in there is not supported. Um, yeah. We could even say why it's not supported in view that shows up with the dotted edge, dotted line edge. Okay, so prevent default. Um, you know what? Do I want to be that guy? We could prevent the default um, browser Forget it. This is fine. This is fine. Okay, drag over, prevent default. I'm gonna test this one more time, see if it's actually necessary. With the changes we made, it might not be. Um, back to adder. Unbelievable. It is necessary. Well, mazel tov, you little... Okay. Uh, so drag over prevents default drag over events, which I guess would tell the browser to load what's being dragged as a file. Drag leave. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Right, so drag enter. If a pop-up's open, it returns. Uh, it prevents the default browser action 
and then it adds the accepting drag class to the body and this turns off all interaction of descendant HTML elements of body. So all of these no longer broadcast any element, uh, any interaction, any interactive events, just body, which is great. And that means that any of these events that occur are going to come from body, more or less. Like their target will likely be body. Uh, most importantly, the drag leave event. Yes, I think. Is this necessary? Console dot log event dot target dot tag name. If it's always body, then we don't even need to check its type, which would be great. At first it's paper, or drag region, so we do need to check that. So we prevent default no matter what on drag leave, but we will hide the pop-up and make the descendants of the body accept uh, mouse and drag events again um, if this drag leave was triggered by the body. I should test this in other browsers. But this basically makes sure that drag leave and drag enter and drag over, they're only going to be triggered by document body. And we don't have to worry about these child elements um, wigging out. And then drop, event prevent default. We know that the drop succeeds, so we hide the pop-up, we turn off accepting drag, and we start loading the file. Um, you know what? Gotta remember how to run prettier. There we go. Okay, yeah, I have support for it. Yeah. This whole, this whole stream, by the way, is being broadcast from uh, an account on my computer that is d dedicated to streaming so that my personal garbage doesn't end up on screen. Um, and other people's personal garbage doesn't end up on screen. Uh, prettier is a <laughs> prettier is a package from NPM. Um, it's called like the opinionated, or it used to be called the opinionated parser. Oh yeah, it is opinionated. It's a opinionated code formatter, and um, you run it like that. Okay, it likes all my code. But basically, if you know, if there was some line of code somewhere that you know could be better written according to the parameters that I'm calling it with, um, then it will make that change to the file. And that keeps the code smooth and consistent, so that, you know, this file is not too different from, you know, some other JavaScript file. Uh, you know, the style should be more or less the same throughout. Okay, so, considering I build systems for a living, you might be like, why is all this code just floating around in a JavaScript file? This seems a bit casual. Well, in a way you're right. Um, I'll, I'll touch on this again during you know my more expository laden uh, follow-up to this episode of the stream. Uh, but these files to me are kind of like pieces of notepaper. They are not these elegant crystalline, you know, packages of functionality. They get the job done. And, you know, if I can make it more navigable, that's one thing. But for the most part, they're doing their job. They're getting done what needs to get done. Um, and at the end of the day, what they expose to whichever modules import from them, what they expose is the functionality that on a higher level 
the rest of the program actually cares about. So for example, pan zoom, pan zoom, has a whole lot going on. It's got state, right? All these lets, let is JavaScript's uh, variable declaration state uh, 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 keyword for something that can mutate. Um, so all of these are things that can change over time. This is state. Just like in GUI.js, there's state. Let me, let me see where state is used besides the places. That, okay, so current pop-up. I don't think it's exposed. Oh no, it is exposed, okay. Let's find out why. So Wireworld is the entry point. State. So GUI.js. Oh, GUI.state.url, that's why. Okay, so GUI.js has got one responsibility, arguably, one top-level responsibility, which is that all of, the, all of the behavior of the GUI is driven by the functions in here. Uh, admittedly, it's doing some things that in the future it will not be responsible for, namely drawing these graphics to the canvases. Um, but because there's no brains behind the operation yet, because it's all just either GUI or the main class, um, this logic is sitting in here for now. Uh, so that's just what's drawing this. But um, basically all of the code in here drives the behavior of the GUI. I could break it down some more. I don't like having, uh, or, or rather, I'm not, I'm not used to having uh, modules that are more than like 100 lines of code um, in my side projects. Or at least it used to be the case. I might have become more lax over time, which is fine, um, as long as the code is navigable and is readable. Um, you know, most text editors allow you to search for, you know, like const, oopsie, uh, const that. So here's all the, yep, so here's all the constant, oh, you know what, um, const equals something but ends with arrow. So these are all the functions that are, it, that's, that's not good practice. I shouldn't be doing that on stream. Like it might be true, but maybe I should break GUI JS into parts. Some of it is justified like this. Basically, the body of GUI.js isn't just a bunch of declarations, it's also the initialization code that is happening in order. So we are wiring up the stop button, we are wiring up the play pause button, etc. Arguably that belongs in a function, uh, but that function would only ever be called once in the first place. GUI.js essentially is that function. I'm, I'm fine with that. Binge vanilla. If, if somebody else would do something a little differently, then by all means. But this is actually serving its purpose, as long as it's readable. So I might reevaluate the readability of GUI.js. But it's actually doing what it should be doing. Some of these functions are explicit, like show about pop-up, hide about pop-up. There's a show and hide pop-up function in GUI.js that is used all over the place. Like in here, right? But it's not exposed outside of the GUI. Because it shouldn't be. It's a very GUI-specific function. That said, there's logic outside of the GUI that would want to show and hide the about pop-up. So those are explicitly provide show error pop-up, hide loading pop-up. Actually, when do you show the loading pop-up? Ah, right, show load from file. 
So this is admittedly a little weird. Show load from file. The GUI is the only place where the app knows it's time to load something. And that's because of these drag and drop elements uh, events that we were messing with. It's because of the uh, this little doohickey down here. Click, right, like this is all through the stuff wired up from GUI. I could expose it, but then like the the lifetime and the methods that govern some GUI elements start being threaded through the module imports and exports, and I don't want to I don't want to deal with that. So it's encapsulated. So we show the loading from file function uh, pop up because of the GUI and hide loading pop-up. Let's see where this is called. Yeah, wire world's load function. This is a little hairy. Um, whether we show about or show the loading pop-up is dependent on whether this is the first file we're loading. Basically, when the app initializes, we want to show the splash. And while we're showing, and that's the same pop-up as this, right? The only difference is, in the initial context, it's used to represent the loading of the file. Simultaneously with just saying, Wildwood Player, concept by Brian Silverman, blah, 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 blah. So maybe, maybe there's some room for improvement here, where some of that logic about how to show the load could be encapsulated like this this could just be state.loading with splash in the GUI I'll look into that this isn't the thing is all of this is supplementary to what we actually want to do which is make these things behave like so this will take a minute ball. Okay. So again, these pixels that have these intricate patterns, they follow rules that change their color over time. And if you do that fast enough, the patterns that are occurring, at least in wire world, kind of resemble electrical signals and digital operations, right? We want to get to that. And to do that in here, we can't just show a straightforward image like this. We need something that consumes this whole pattern and does some reckoning about it. I was thinking that that would be the topic for this first stream, but not yet. Not while I'm in drag and drop land. Let me commit this. Okay, so drag events are now handled better. Oh, I still need to test this actually. In okay. Yeah, that looks good. Firefox is happy. Quit. Let's try Chrome. Chrome is not happy. Glad I checked. Now what, right? Okay. Drag enter.
Oh, it's because I need to clear its cache. Chrome's happy. Okay. False alarm. Yep. Cool. By switching off pointer events in CSS during a drag operation. Switching off pointer events in CSS during a drag operation. Drag leave events get broadcast by the document body. Okay. 2107, coming up towards the end of the stream. Honestly, while I wish I could have said more about the point of this project, this was definitely a good first episode for learning the ropes, getting a good handle on how this whole stream thing works, let me hide that again. Minimize. Okay. Do I even use these? Probably not. Yeah, Search engines know what to do with it in the first place. Uh, this would be outdated and shouldn't be referenced anyway. What is overwrite? Oh yeah, overwrite. While I was messing around with the uh, WW GUIs. I completely skipped the WWE. Okay. We're going to hop over to qu quickly to talk about <laughs> CSS again. Um, WW GUI is the system for making the GUI look like this. Um, it's separated into WW GUI and WW icons. For WW icons, it's all pretty straightforward. Um, the background image for a bunch of things are set to these SVG files. SVG is a scalable vector graphics. You can look at some. So like, 
announcer.svg, this file can be loaded up into a web browser and be zoomed into technically infinitely. The browser itself won't allow me to use any, you know, page zoom, but take my word for it, it is a vector graphic that is infinitely scalable. Um, there's quite a lot of those. plain text files, really, that just have some artwork in them represented by these geometric primitives that have styling applied to them, like stroke width and stroke fill. Um, and by setting those as background images in these components, it populates them in here. So these are background images. That's one of three ways to shove SVG into HTML nowadays. Another one is inline, uh, which I'm not going to do because I don't want index HTML to get any larger than it currently is. Um, you know, it's just fine to have these be background images. Um, but, you know, if they were inline uh, or if they were uh, embedded in an object tag, which is really old school. Um, then I'd be able to use CSS to change the colors of things in this SVG, which was a tempting prospect that led me down the wrong path for uh, quite a while while I was fleshing this stuff out. The meat of WWGUI is this really large CSS, 400 lines. Um, up top, so remember, WWGUI, the class, uh, ends up on the body tag. Um, although it could end up on other tags, right? Um, I'm trying to, when I first wrote this, I guess, I was trying to think ahead and be like, well, what if this ends up on something that's not a body tag? Um, I'm using CSS values, uh, sorry, CSS value, variables to store a bunch of colors and give them useful descriptive names. Um, there's the font size. The text is monospace. For the most part, in pop-ups it isn't. Um, right, WW caption are these span classes that are basically the content of buttons. So when accessibility is on, reset and play pause and step are text inside spans of WW caption. And the reason that they don't show up in normal mode like that, that's that's not what we want, right? It says there reset. You can make it out visually. Zoom it in. The text is there. We don't want it to be there. But because it's in spans with the class WW caption, I can use this uh, style declaration to Hide them. Boom. Gone. Um, for buttons, like I said before, I have to like unset some things. That's what overwrite CSS is. It's a reminder of what all the things are that um, that the different browsers do to their buttons and input objects um, and labels, I guess. Although I didn't do anything with the label, I don't think. So I unset what the browser does to make buttons look the way they do, and then I style them out, and then I do this important stuff that makes sure that the background image is properly positioned. So if I comment that out and reload, look at this. Like you can see the background images on some of these. It's hard to make some of them out, but they're there. Um, I want them to be sized to contain, right? I don't want them to repeat, and I want them to be center aligned horizontally and vertically in their parent objects. That's what does that. Now for styling, I make the Mickey Mouse hand show up on buttons and inputs. Well, not inputs, because of the drag. Um, on various browsers, the button has a shadow DOM that does various things. So I think for Firefox, this is a little hairy, but 
Firefox does some of this stuff, and Chrome does some of this stuff, and WebKit does some of this stuff. Um, but I make sure that the hover states are properly implemented and... Right, for focus... The reason that focus looks like this, and not the default kind of like glow, if I comment these out, we'll see that focus is normally this glow that kind of follows the boundary of the object, right? So instead of that, sorry, one second. Someone wants to be let out. the most interesting code in the world in the world uh, so yeah WW GUI does a bunch of things like this uh, we just saw um, we just saw how it makes the buttons fancy uh, labels don't need any unsetting but I am preventing their selection uh, so that you know when you like drag your mouse over everything you're not like selecting text left and right. Although, arguably that's poor usability. I'll have to think about that, I'll have to ruminate over that. And yeah, for a label maybe, I'll think it over. Arguably this stuff should be selectable. Checkboxes are especially weird. Um, a checkbox is an input tag, and an input tag on the web cannot have children. It's like an image tag. It's got no contents. It's self-closing. Although, in my project, because of prettier... Uh, one second. No word wrap. That was weird. Oh, that's much better. I don't know why I was... Okay. <laughs> so, you know, unlike button which can contain text and images. An input tag, doesn't matter what kind it is, can't contain anything. Prettier does this self-closing thing, which technically should not be done in HTML5, but it's a good idea. It makes it more XML-ish, it makes it a little bit easier to make sense of what tags contain what. Um, but yeah, a checkbox input, um, Obviously I can unset some stuff, but then to make the state change is actually kind of tricky. I think that's the only checkbox that I have, but let's see. Checkbox hover, checkbox active, focus, checked. Here we go. So at the moment, checked turbo, this could probably go down. So when a checkbox is checked, all I'm doing is giving it a filter, which is inherited from SVG. Um, this basically makes it brighter. It's the reason why it's brighter now and back to normal when I uncheck it. So checked, unchecked. Um, on top of that, <laughs> the turbo button, I have it doing a full turn, so it kind of looks like a washing machine. Actually, this is inspired by iTunes burn icon from back in the day. Uh, spinning. Type GIF. I should probably turn on safe search. Um, well, for now you'll have to take my word for it, but um, when you burn a CD on Max, like 10 years ago, the radioactive icon that is still 
hidden in the OS uh, would would rotate as the disk was burned, as a kind of progress, as a kind of um, you know indeterminate progress indicator. So I just thought I would uh, I would make that happen in here. Though there is some aspect of it. It's hard to tell, but there's something going around the rim. Anyway. I'm not too worried about it. It's just a visual embellishment. Um, and of course, it looks cooler than what it does. Because right now, it does nothing. Um, range inputs are sliders, so there's a whole lot... You know, sliders... Sliders contain a lot of things. This doesn't look like a normal slider. Um, on WebKit, in Chrome, and on Firefox, sliders are made of all different ty kinds of things. So WWGUI properly unsets all of those, and, you know, WebKit slider thumb, Mozilla range thumb, hover focuses for all that, slider thumb active, um, range thumb. It's a whole bunch of malarkey just to make all of the sliders look the same and not carry the styling that the browsers in initialize them with. But it looks good. At least, I think it looks good. I like it. Check this out. When you mouse over it, I've got JavaScript. Is it JavaScript? I think I've got JavaScript that does this. Gradual... You know what? That might just be Safari doing... See. I wonder. Here. I can disable JavaScript and reload and see what happens. Um, inspect. Toggle visibility. Okay. <laughs> so this is all HTML and CSS. There's no JavaScript doing that. And that is normal and... Okay, yeah. I'm trying to scroll on it and nothing's happening, which is proof positive that JavaScript is responsible for this scroll event. Although... Oh, right. Let me try it down here. That's where it's more impressive, because this is an actually live and dynamic um, slider. So, smooth scroll correlates with the scroll of the image. And of course, you can do this as well. Reset. Um, and if you shift the browser focus to it, like so, um, up and down, and left and right, and page up and page down, all work the way that I guess you would you would intuitively expect. I believe that is from the. I'm beginning to forget. Pan zoom, uh, page down. Digit zero, that's... Yeah, no. That's personal, that's like, uh, that's something I did. For reset. It kinda doesn't belong there. Yeah, I might want to take that out of PanZoom and put it in GUI.js or something, but regardless. Um, you know, if you look at sliders as they usually are, it's nowhere near the same. So the interactive stuff, the JavaScript-driven stuff, is the same, right? Zoom in, zoom out, update the slider and stuff like that. Um, but the thumb and the track and the background and the position of all that stuff um, browsers differ wildly on how they do all of that. So it takes a lot of CSS to make it all behave the way that I want it to. But, works out fine. No JavaScript necessary um, to at least make the appearance do what it does. Um, WW groups we touched on. That's, well, let me turn 
there we go. WW groups make sure that like the first child and the last child in a group um, have round corners on the outer facing edges and all the other edges are square. That's what that is, border radius, right? And border radius. Background position. So, you know, optically, uh, I move the icons in these things towards their end just so that they look a little bit more natural. Labels in a group get special treatment. I think this is a label, right? Loading bar is that barber pole that shows up here when you load. And so it's got a linear gradient background of barber pole variety. <laughs> Um, and it animates with these keyframes. And these are all driven by a variable loading bar size, which is specified in loading bar. That's a bit strange. WWGUI loading bar, and then down here, loading bar. Yeah, that's fine. Arguably, I should have a default loading bar uh, declaration that provides a value for these things. Drag region, so the checkerboard back here is another gradient. This is a repeating conic gradient. Took a little... Let's see, I think it started with something from CSS Tricks. Yeah, like the structure of this started with something I copy-pasted from CSS Tricks. And then custom values. These probably could go in the top-level uh, variables for, um, for colors of the UI. Um, and then this is you know, structured in such a way as to cause a checkerboard pattern with this, uh, with this repeating conic. Let's see. Pop-ups, sans serif. Um, links are bold and, uh, regular color, like, uh, like that, but they're still underlined even though they're not blue. Loading bar, button... Right, buttons in pop-up bars do this. Whereas, you know, regular buttons don't have that sort of logic. And then some miscellaneous styles that help with some of the styling here in the Wire World Player Help. Three solid hours of programming live to almost no one, which is fine. Um, oh, that's a bug. I gotta look into that. Eh, I can wait. Three solid hours, I did not actually talk about why I'm doing this. I'll say this, I'm doing this because I did it before, and I kind of want to get in touch with who I was when I wrote the Flash version, which I already closed. You remember it, at the very beginning of this stream. I want to bring this back. So, somebody on Twitter a few months ago asked what resources are available to students who are interested in cellular automata. And, you know, I, I linked to the Wireworld computer, which is what this is, basically. This is the Wireworld computer by Owen and more. Um, but that's a Java applet that doesn't run. And previously, it was my Flash app that no longer runs because Flash has basically been ripped out of the web stack as of December of last year. And that's a shame. 
Now there are ways of doing what I'm aiming to do with this app outside of the browser. There's an app called Golly that basically does, where are you? Wireworld, hang on, patterns, Wireworld, here we go. So, you know, this app already does what the Flash app previously did and what I intend to do. It actually does a whole lot more. There's this really interesting button here called Hyperspeed, which is very similar to this turbo button that currently does nothing. Um, except Golly's hyperspeed definitely does something, and I intend down the road on this stream to implement the same functionality, which is well outside of my comfort zone or anything that I've previously done. Anyway, I am parched. I am second guessing my presentation of the project tonight. change transform should be on the turbo checkbox exclusively tiny little commit this has been a good first impression of or not impression first uh, first first go at wireworld wednesday um What's funny is, it was completely off the cuff when I actually have, you know, a plan for how to cover what this whole project is about and what it's made of and stuff. So next week, I will follow that plan to the letter. At least some of it. Um, yeah, the work that I did tonight you know, doesn't seem like all that much. The fact that Prettier didn't even have to reformat anything is an indication that it didn't do all that much. But this is the way that programming works, especially on a hobby project, where, you know, you can dedicate small pieces of your life at a time, and they just get applied where, uh... Oh, Diddly's back. Hey, Diddly. Yeah, no, plans never work out. Uh... Yeah, I think, you know, what's weird about this stream is it's also going to turn this project into like a measured thing because I'm trying to promise to myself to not work on it outside of Wireworld Wednesdays. And what that means is the spurts of activity that usually drive my side projects are not going to happen here. And that's going to make it interesting. What that might also mean is it might end up conforming to some of this stuff uh, in the long run. I wouldn't put it past me, because here's the thing. This is also being recorded. Uh, chat isn't. <laughs> so uh, anyone watching this video is not going to know what I'm talking about when I talk to people in chat. There's got to be a way to fix that. Um, yeah, I'll figure that out. But, uh, yeah, because it's being recorded, because it's a, uh, hopefully something that people can watch or I can take snippets from, um, that represent the act of programming, doing some of it in the style of a curriculum kind of makes sense. Not all of it. Definitely not all of it. Um, you know, I am not... I mean, I've, I've taught programming before. I am not teaching programming on this stream. Uh, I might teach some concepts, especially some things that are web-specific. Um, I am here to learn and apparently ramble. But I appreciate your time for tuning in. It is 9.34. 
uh, Pacific time. And that means it is time for me to GTFO. From the skybox at the edge of the level, this is Res Mason signing off.